Uh, we want to start off by saying uh, that this work is funded um, by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications here at the University of Illinois, as well as the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment, and uh, another U.S. foundation called the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Also, if you want to learn more about our project, uh, we invite you to visit our website at cropsandsilico.org. And later on in the presentation, we'll have some other websites that you can actually access the framework and the documentation that goes with it. All right. Uh, so to get started, um, so I work on, on plants. I actually work on a model plant called Arabidopsis. But uh, being a model plant, a lot of the things that we discovered there, we can translate into our crops. And so most of us are aware that with climate change, it's going to become increasingly difficult to meet the global demand for staple crops. And so strategies are needed for us to improve food security today and also in the future. So many of these strategies focus on understanding the relationship between plant genotypes and phenotypes. And this is a relationship that geneticists have been trying to understand for decades. And, uh, and so one of the things that we try to do with our, our genetic techniques, whether it's traditional breeding or molecular breeding that we do now, is, is try to um, find ways that we can build better crops. Um, and we call these crops idiotypes because they're ideal crops which means that they're going to yield really well, they're gonna do well under certain environments. Um, and geneticists have not always been successful at this. And so there's a study from the 1930s uh, where some Japanese geneticists wanted to make um, a delicious idiotype. And so this was the first attempt to build brassico raffinus, or as I like to call it, ravage. And the idea is that they wanted to breed together cabbage and beets and get the best of both worlds. But instead of building this delicious new superfood, it resulted in this sad, sterile plant. And so, you know, I like this as an example of um, some of our failed attempts at, bidding, at building these idiotypes. And we've gotten a lot better over the years because our technologies have also gotten better. And so as we move towards this more prescriptive idiotype development, we can take advantage of, of new technologies and newer technologies as they're coming out. Uh, some of those include uh, high throughput phenotyping, gene editing, and of course, uh, high throughput computing. And so one of the things uh, or strategies that I think unites all of these new technologies is mathematical modeling and computational modeling. And so I'm not the only biologist who thinks that mathematical models of plants is fantastic. So in fact, about um, 4,000 publications have come out over the last 10 years describing different mathematical models of plants. A lot of these are for model plants like what I work on, um, but also are for staple crops. Um, one of the limitations of these mathematical models, though, is that they were designed to address a very specific question about a very specific pathway or process. And so what that means is that all of the other pathways and processes that are not being modeled are lumped into some black box. But I think that we have the information and the technology today to begin filling in those black boxes by connecting some of these existing models and moving toward building virtual crops. And this isn't a new idea, this sort of integrative modeling that's filling in those black boxes. Um, so integrative and multi-scale modeling is being done in other communities um, outside of plant biology. So in mammals, there's the Virtual Physiological Rat Project, and it's really focused on understanding the biology of cardiovascular diseases. And then there's the holy grail of biological modeling, which is a whole cell model of um, 
mycoplasm genitalium, and they're using this as a tool for discovery. And so this is a fully linked model all the way from genes connected to physiological responses. And then there's also the Open Worm Project where they're, they're building a virtual worm. This is C. elegans, which is another model organism. And so um, knowing that these things exist and that the t technology is out there and available, you know, we've asked the question, can the plant biology community do the same? Can we start connecting the information that we have at these different biological levels so that we can build whole virtual crops and begin to do in silico experimentation and move toward models that are really heuristic, things that we can use to make predictions about how that organism is going to respond to different perturbations, whether they're genetic or environmental perturbations. And so what we're doing here at the University of Illinois is that we've started a project that's called Crops in Silico. And we're going to spend the rest of our time together describing what Crops in Silico is. So first and foremost, I guess, is that it's really a computational framework. And within this framework, uh, we have software that is able to connect models. We also have a place for researchers to deposit their models. And we're building a user interface that is accessible to both modelers, computer scientists, um, but also domain experts that really don't have any expertise in modeling. And then crops in silico is also uh, this, this goal of building our virtual crop models. And crops in silico is also a community effort. And so really it was this desire to build virtual crop models by connecting different domain experts um, and our current community that inspired the creation of our computational framework. And so even though our long-term goal is to build whole crop models like uh, what was done for um, the, the bacteria, the, the human pathogen, um, we're also building crops in silico and using that framework um, to, to do just in, in silico experimentation um, where we can take the models that are available to us and begin to mix and match these plug-and-play modules um, that we can combine in different ways like puzzle pieces to address some very specific biological questions. And so in this um, kind of cute little animation, what we can see here is that we have this virtual crop backbone that we can choose um, which model of photosynthesis do we want to use to address our specific question. And why we would want to do this is because there are different equations describing the same process and depending on the model that you're plugging into, one might be more appropriate than the other. But again, this is giving the user a platform for this in silico experimentation and discovery. And so now I'm going to turn um, this over to Matt Turk, who will talk uh, about the nitty gritty of the computational framework. Hi. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to, to present to you. Uh, I'm going to, as Amy said, I'm going to talk about the computational framework. I want to note that. Uh, uh, throughout this, I'll be talking about things that, in in uh, great uh, that to a great extent, were developed uh, by Megan Lang, a research scientist at NCSA, as part of this project. Um, so we set out with our understanding of where we wanted to uh, where we wanted to go with the model crop, similar to or as as Amy described, and from this, we were able to back out several different requirements. Um, we needed to be able to have the models that are communicating with each other uh, be able to communicate despite the fact that they're likely written in different programming languages. Um, we needed them to be able to be executed in parallel because oftentimes we would be stuck in a situation where uh, one would be executing and waiting for, for output from another, but there are non-blocking operations that could go on at the exact same time. And we also needed to be able to set up automated transformation of data that gets passed between the models. This might be something like uh, data comes out in units of Kelvin, but needs to be accepted in units of uh, Celsius, let's say. Uh, but it might also be something more complex, such as uh, data is output in a volume and it needs to be input in a, an extracted mesh from that volume or a reconstructed point cloud or something like that. Um, 
I would also note that while I won't be discussing it uh, at, at length, one of the, the uh, side effects of allowing for data transformation in an automated way is that we can also instrument the entire uh, modeling process and insert visualization and in-situ data capture uh, throughout the entire process as well. Um, I, will, I would like to, to note, uh, just as, as, as an interesting point of, of comparison, uh, I, I am indeed, as, as I as introduced, uh, appointed in the astronomy department as well as the School of Information Sciences. Um, and while it, it, uh, one of the neat things about uh, working on plants is that there are some similar challenges to uh, the way that we study, the way that galaxies form uh, and, and stars move about those galaxies. And I'll talk about a couple of those, but things like timescale distinctions, uh, units, completely different mechanisms for modeling things, these are problems that we see across different domains. And so uh, I, I'd like to think that some of the, thing, the solutions that have been uh, implemented and designed inside this interface can be applied uh, elsewhere as well. So one of the, the very first challenges that we ran into was uh, that we needed to be able to interface things like uh, modules that were models that were written in Python with models that were written in C++. Uh, a very concrete example of this is that we have a Python model that uh, manages the gene, regula uh, gene regulation, whereas uh, we have a C++ mechanism for ray tracing and doing photosynthesis inside uh, a model crop. We need to be able to output from one and input into the other, uh, but unfortunately the mechanisms for communication between these are uh, typically quite invasive. And so when I say invasive, I don't necessarily mean that they require fundamental structural changes to the, to the programs, but they typically require a degree of introspection uh, for both the Python and the C++ sides uh, that can be, can be somewhat challenging for individuals to implement. So while we might be able to write a wrapper in Swig or Boost or Cython uh, for the C++ model to expose it to Python, um, that requires a fair bit of work on the part of the individual that's, that's uh, using it. And it also, in many cases, will tie the two models together forever. So if you write a Python wrapper for a C++ module, that's wonderful, uh, but oftentimes you'll run into someone that has also written, say, a MATLAB wrap or a MATLAB model that you need to interface with. And so we were dealing with a situation where we had not just uh, one to one to one or N to M, but uh, many to many uh, transformations. Um, and so this, this communication can be hard for you know, any number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that uh, things like subsetting and selecting of the data and integrating across different time steps can also pose challenges. We don't want to force a rewrite between different models because as we'll, we'll talk about toward the end of the presentation, uh, one of the things that we, we have recognized with the Crops and Silico project is that as we attempt to work with people from across different uh, different research groups and so on, is that the higher the barrier to entry for collaboration, uh, the, the, lower the, incentive, or the, the lower the incentive for productive collaboration across domains. And so what we want to do is lower that barrier to entry and reduce as much of the, the, the technical friction to collaboration as possible. When we want to do things like transform data, so uh, one of the examples that I gave earlier was that uh, you may want to change units, uh, but it may also be something like you want to do an aggregation of uh, total outputs between different models. Uh, typically requires writing uh, code that, that's new in order to perform that transformation and then duplicating that across the different models that you need to perform the aggregations, or it also requires rewriting of input and output code. Uh, what we ended up deciding on was to implement a, uh, an API for this, uh, so an application programming interface uh, inside each model's native language in order to send and receive data. This provides a couple different things for us. Uh, the primary one is that it provides a very small surface area over which individual model developers need to be comfortable. So if I'm developing a model in MATLAB, I have a reasonably small surface area with which I need to interface with the crops and silico uh, interface itself. And so that reduces the complexity on my part for implementing new models and for exposing my model and using information uh, generated by other models. It also provides a stable contract between the model and sys interface and the crops and silico project in that uh, we are able to change the uh, mechanisms by which uh, sys interface uh, communicates across nodes, uh, communicates within nodes, all the different methods by which data is transferred uh, without changing necessarily the API with, uh, that the model uh, developers actually interact with. This 
contract between the uh, the model developer and sys interface itself allows us to to develop new methods for uh, for decomposing across uh, work uh, workload across different nodes allows us to experiment with things like different uh, queuing systems so for instance starting we started with amqp uh, uh, yeah, AMQP, uh, we've moved on to using 0MQ, we're exploring an MPI backend, but all of these are done without uh, having to change the API because we've constructed it at a high level. So this ends up reducing the modification of source code. We don't need uh, individual model developers to be aware of the communication mechanism, although of course they, they are able to be so. And this also allows connectivity when the format of the request and the response are different. And I'm going to uh, to, to dive into that just a little bit more, but uh, this is an excellent example of the, uh, uh, it was the, the crabage, crabage, rabage, rabage uh, mm -hmm. example. So um, one, uh, so perhaps you, you're familiar with the notion of, of round trip, uh, you know, interfaces. So the idea being that you have different methods that, that construct systems for, uh, transmit for traveling from for transporting from one place to another you want to know how am i going to do this this trip uh, but you don't actually uh, need to necessarily know the specifics of the format as long as you have a stable interface with which you can you can uh, construct that uh, that decision making process so the sys interface is a python package uh, you can actually find both the documentation at our github.io site at slash sys underscore interface uh, and the source code is completely open. And last I saw, it was at 99% test coverage, uh, which is actually, uh, which is, is pretty great, uh, I think. Um, what it's designed to do is it's designed to allow, in, uh, allow you to input output both from models and files, as well as to uh, transmit data uh, you know, across nodes as well. So this allows for parallel execution of models. It has uh, Linux. It uh, it has support on Linux, Mac OS X, and Windows. And actually, uh, the Windows support uh, was one of the more challenging uh, things to to implement. But it connects models written in Python, MATLAB, C, and C++. And additionally, there is work underway to ensure that the MATLAB interface is completely compatible with Octave, uh, as well as to add on. Uh, additional uh, model interfaces. We've had requests for uh, Fortran interfaces, as well as uh, abstracting up to a little bit higher level in Python, where uh, you can, where this interface can do a bit more of the job for you if you symbolically define something in a computer algebra system like SymPy. This can uh, read and write to a number of different uh, data formats, including things like, uh, you know, uh, lowest common denominator, such as CSV or tab delimited formats, but it can also store in Python pickles, uh, pandas data frames. Uh, and then one of the things that I, I actually uh, like the most about it is that um, 3D mesh formats like OBJ and PLY can, can sometimes be uh, challenging to convert between, or at least uh, a little bit uh, tedious to convert between, and it will perform those conversions automatically. And then it has a number of different uh, interprocess communication mechanisms as well that work either on a single um, machine or distributed compute infrastructure. So API calls are all done in the model's native language. So as I noted, this Python, MATLAB, C, C++. Um, and this allows us to do very minimal modification. The process of converting a model to utilize this interface uh, for input or output actually not only allows the model to continue reading from uh, say if it's if it's designed to read files from disk it allows it to continue acting as though it is reading those files from disk and to actually execute in isolation while reading those files from disk but it also allows that interface that uh, input to come from somewhere else as a concrete example of this what what I mean is that if I have a file that typically gets it gets its uh, input from a comma separated values file that that exists next to it on a file system. If I convert that, that uh, model to utilize this interface as its input output mechanism, it can continue to read from that comma separated value. But if I modify the uh, execution environment for it, uh, it can also read that from another executing model that may not even know that it's providing data to, to my model. So this allows us to transparently uh, connect Python and MATLAB uh, models. So, the process by which we do this is by uh, utilizing both the API inside our model itself, 
and constructing uh, what's known as a YAML file to describe the model. YAML, um, I can never remember if the YA in this is yet another, uh, but I believe it's yet another markup language. Ooh, no. YAML ain't markup language. Right. And YAML I'm the biologist. Eight, yes. So YAML ain't markup language um, that describes the model, and I'll show uh, what that looks like uh, in just a moment. Uh, but we describe the model. You instrument the model with the API calls, and then you connect different models using uh, YAML files that describe those connections themselves. So returning to my notion of my own isolated model, this means that I can instrument it. And then if my YAML file uh, that describes the connections describes them to connect to a file on disk, I can continue running it uh, in my isolated testing. So the overhead to converting to, some, to utilize this interface is reasonably small. This also allows us to do uh, parallel execution. So because we're now describing the necessities for input and output, we've constructed what amounts to a, to a directed acyclic graph, of, or well, I suppose it's not acyclic, but we've constructed a dependency graph uh, for the execution of models, and so we can evaluate our data flow and allow uh, uh, asynchronous uh, execution to, to be conducted. Um, it seems I was not expecting this animation. So as we walk through the, the time step, we may have some models that uh, operate on very long time steps, other models that operate on very short time steps, and then they can provide cyclic parameter updates, uh, which we can automatically distribute uh, throughout the workload. So returning to this notion of constructing a YAML file, adding the API calls, and then connect them through YAML files, this actually looks rather uh, straightforward. Uh, so here is a simple photosynthetic uh, model. Uh, this is a, uh, believe it or not, this is a real model. Um, it is a simplified one, as you'll note from the single calculate photosynthetic rate line of code. Uh, but here you'll see that it's reading from disk, it's taking things from the arguments provided to it, it's loading, and then it saves things back out. To instrument this for sys interface, we change our imports a little bit, and then instead of reading from disk, we input from a channel called temperature. We input from a channel called CO2, we input from a channel called light intensity, and we output to a channel called photosynthesis rate. Um, we then change the different ways that we call receive and the ways that we send. And so we've minimally changed our, our model itself, but now we've allowed it to be con uh, connected. So now we have something like a photosynthesis YAML file. Here are our arguments. Uh, and you know this is somewhat of boilerplate code here, but we provide our input channels we provide our output channels, and then we connect one output to another input. So here, input from photosynthesis rate, output to growth photo rate, uh, as an example. So here, this is the input growth photo rate, and we can connect our different models, and then we execute them, uh, and the load is distributed. Now, this is, uh, as you may note, a little bit of, <coughs> excuse me, this can provide a bit of an, uh, an overhead, especially for uh, developing new models and so on, uh, because you are still, even though it's in YAML, uh, you are still writing a fair bit of boilerplate code. We've been working on a first iteration of uh, model repository and submission forms that will do several different steps for you. You describe the model, uh, you describe the inputs and the outputs, uh, and then it will generate a YAML file for you. Uh, but we're also moving this to a completely uh, uh, web-based interface uh, where you can construct the YAML files for individual models, and then you can also construct uh, uh, you can also construct the connection and orchestration files as well. So this is a uh, demonstration of our of the uh, the preliminary uh, graphical user interface that we we have been developing here at NCSA. Um, and credit to, for this goes to Mike Lambert and Craig Willis. Uh, it's a standard visual programming environment where each one of the different items on the palette comes from a model definition uh, in YAML. These can then be constructed and saved as an ensemble, which can then be modified. Uh, and then we'll be able to augment this uh, with data transformation as well as in situ visualization uh, inside these, these uh, models themselves. Great. Here. Uh, so now um, I'm going to tell you how we as the plant biologists are using this framework for us to gain some new biological insights. So uh, to do this and to test out the framework and see how this is working, we've done a few different proof of concept studies. 
And in our first proof of concept, we asked the question, can we simulate soybean response to elevated CO2 at multiple scales? And like any good proof of concept model, we ask a question that we already know the answer to. And so we're really fortunate here at the University of Illinois that we have this ongoing experiment out in the field that's called soy face. And FACE stands for Free Air Concentration Enrichment. And so this means that at the field scale, I don't know if you can see it, but you see these rings um, in this picture. So in each one of these rings, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, like a higher concentration of carbon dioxide is being blown over the plants. And it's very sophisticated. Um, it knows the direction of the wind, so it knows which side to um, turn up the CO2 emission so that it'll blow that way and, and whatever. So within each one of these circles is an enrichment of atmospheric carbon dioxide, whereas outside of the circle is our ambient carbon dioxide concentrations that you and I are breathing. And so uh, this soy face experiment has been around for um, more than a decade now. And many different insights uh, have been gained using this experiment. So, and a lot of these have to do with photosynthesis and photosynthetic efficiency and how that's going to change in response to a changing environment. So really what this field scale experiment is doing is trying to understand and gain insight into how plants are going to respond to future atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. And so one of the things that was found in this uh, soy face experiment was that leaf photosynthesis increased 25% across a growing season under elevated CO2 compared to ambient CO2. And this is something that, um, that people didn't know, that there was some sort of increase in photosynthesis in response to CO2 under growth chamber conditions, but a lot of things that we do in the lab don't translate into the field. Um, another insight that was gained using this field experiment is that there is an increase in yield with elevated CO2 in the field for um, our major staple crops, including soybean, rice, and wheat. And so some other things that were found were other principles um, that we uh, see something called photosynthetic accl acclimation um, under elevated CO2. There's this initial jump in productivity and photosynthetic efficiency in plants when exposed to elevated CO2, but at some point it levels out. Um, and some thoughts are that the, the plant really can't keep up with this enriched CO2, right? Think of it as the plant's food, um, but it doesn't grow exponentially, so it, uh, it reaches some steady state. Okay. So those are the insights that we have from the field level experiment. And just to remind you, the question that we're asking is now, can we simulate soybean response to elevated CO2 at multiple scales? And when I say multiple scales, I mean multiple biological scales. Can we go from the level of the cell, um, what's happening to the cellular entities like uh, DNA and RNA, up to the whole plant level or the organ level, so the leaf and the root and so to do this, um, we had three different models, two cellular level models and one organ level model. This is the organ level model. This is a leaf level model that simulates photosynthetic response to elevated CO2. And this is an ecophysiology model. So there are some things that this model on its own can do and things that it can't do. What it can do is mimic plant response to the field environment, but it isn't mechanistic at all. So this is based on empirical data, and the only mechanistic bit that it has in it is it has this biochemical photosynthesis model, um, but the only biochemistry that it's modeling is for one enzyme. And there are dozens of enzymes that are involved in the process of photosynthesis. So the major limitation is that this lacks any mechanistic detail beyond Rubisco biochemistry, and Rubisco is um, the major enzyme that's involved. And so what that means for this model is that under the, the conditions that are parameterized, it can, it can predict what has been observed. 
But once you start making perturbations and changing things, it does a really poor job of predicting plant response. And that's because it lacks any mechanistic detail of what's happening at the level of the enzymes, what's going on at the cellular level, and really only um, predicting something that's at this higher physiological level. So alternatively, another uh, researcher has built a photosynthetic model that is entirely mechanistic. And so you can see from this image that each one of these boxes uh, represents a different enzyme that's involved in photosynthesis. And so this entirely mechanistic metabolic flux model is able to find the optimal enzyme concentrations and fluxes to increase photosynthetic capacity in, in plants, um, in particular soybean. So the limitation of this model though, is that it's not able to reproduce photosynthetic acclimation. One of those things that was observed at soy face, it can't do it. And this is because it has no link up to the physiological level and it's entirely based on enzyme kinetics. Um, and so, it, so it's very limited in that sense. Um, finally, we have another cellular level model. This one is based on gene expression. And so there was a data set by uh, Dr. Andrew Leakey. So all of these models that I'm showing you are from different researchers here at the University of Illinois that work out at Soyface. It's Andrew Leakey, Steve Long, Carl Bernacki, and Jingwan Zhu while he was here. He's now at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, so this final model is of gene expression. And my group wrote this very simple translation model where we take the gene expression data from this 2009 study and we were pretty much modeling the biological process of translation. So if you remember your biology class, you go from DNA to RNA to protein, we're modeling that step from RNA to protein. So the capability of this model is that it can estimate the relative changes in protein concentrations that are based on transcript abundance. So protein based on RNA levels. The limitation, uh, similar to that of that mechanistic flux model, is that it's only able to describe the transcriptional response and no physiological outcome. So I think you see where I'm going with this. Um, we have these three independent models, um, and these independent models describe individual processes, and they do a fine job of describing those individual processes, but as I highlighted, they have their limitations. So the idea is that the integrated models will replicate biological phenomenon better and help us move towards a more predictive model. And so these are the defined linkages among these three models. Um, so pretty much where we are right now is that we use the output of one model to feed into and become an input of another model. However, we do have some feedback between them. And I, again, our um, more long-term goal is to have um, complete feed, feed forward and feedback. All right, so we do have some results here. And if we only integrate the metabolic flux model with that leaf level ecophysiology model, we can simulate a standard ACI curve. And so what this curve is showing you is just carbon assimilation by the plant. So this is the plant photosynthesizing. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned before, the metabolic flux model, it has some limitations, and so that means that it is blind to exogenous CO2 concentrations. So you're going to get this same curve no matter what the CO2 concentration is, whether it's ambient or elevated. But when we incorporated the gene expression data, the, the gene expression model, this allows the integrated model to respond to changes in exogenous CO2. And what's important about this is that this mimics what was observed at soy face in those experiments in which there's increased photosynthetic capacity at elevated CO2. And what this means for us is that only the integrated model is able to predict crop photosynthetic response to future atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And now we have a mechanistically informed model that links changes in gene expression to physiological response. And so if you remember our very first slide, where this is our goal, we want to be able to link genotype to phenotype. Um, this is one proof of concept where we're doing that. We're going from genes to phenotypes or physiological characteristics. 
So now uh, we are primed to add an additional layer to this modeling effort by scaling up to the crop canopy level by integrating models of 3D geometry and ray tracing. And do I need to play, push play on this? Okay. So we have been uh, working with the Advanced Visualization Lab at uh, NCSA here to develop data-driven 3D models of both individual soybean plants as well as whole crop canopies. And uh, if we can get it to play, oh, okay. Yeah, and so this makes uh, really beautiful movies of our crop canopy. But uh, not only that, it's visually stimulating. Um, it, it's a way of us, for us to look at this as, as biologists, and it's so much more intuitive to see these plants growing, um, not in real time. I mean, this is vastly sped up. What, what we're watching is soybean plants growing over the course of an entire season. Um, but what the video is showing is really the same thing that a series of, of graphs could. Like this is the mean number of nodes um, over a growing season, but we've also layered on additional information that we can take in all at the same time uh, and help us work towards this, this more accurate representation of plants, both um, by linking the biology and the models, but then visualizing that integrated model output. Do you wanna say something? So as we, we move forward, we're also working to uh, develop um, uh, advanced ray or well, not, uh, we're working to develop ray tracers or, or path tracers that can simulate light absorption through a crop canopy. So using our data-driven methods for developing the uh, structure of the canopy itself, we're working to uh, develop ray tracers that can simulate uh, both gray and multi-spectrum light as it uh, arrives bounces between the different leaves, and then ends up computing the light intensity of each leaf, which can provide input, uh, both geometric or geometric and in total, to the amount of uh, energy, uh, the magnitude of absorbed life, uh, light for every leaf in the plant, and then can provide input to other photosynthetic models as well. Um, what we've done so far has included replacing the 1D architecture with a full 3D model. Um, typically, we're, we're at present using L systems to develop this, which are uh, mechanisms for recursive structure generation. So for instance, a Sierpinski triangle can be described as an L system. Um, this feeds our photosynthesis model, and then we can uh, construct both data-driven um, uh, results from this, but also data-driven visualizations. And so, for instance, this visualization that you're seeing uh, right now is the magnitude of the absorbed light mapped to a, a color map. Uh, so low absorbed light is at blue and high is at red. Uh, and we can even do things like render moving shadows in order to uh, clarify the time step. And so that's one of the, one of the things that at first blush may seem as though it is a, a, an augmentation that is strictly in the visual, but it also improves uh, Cog uh, cognition as individuals look at these visualizations, providing additional visual cues that help guide researchers' understanding and guide our uh, guide our interpretation of visualizations uh, can increase our ability to interpret, contextualize, and and understand them. So I'll. Uh, the the third sequence, the uh, the third uh, pillar of what we're working on is is broadly speaking defined as community science. Um, one of the interesting uh, things that that we've found is that um, you know it 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 it's cliche to say that uh, as a community we can we can go further together than we could individually, uh, but we have in fact found that to be true. Uh, we've been working on uh, exposing more of the individual plant models, so allowing for domain experts to update values based on experimental data. Uh, but this uh, exposing of individual models also allows individuals to make different assumptions about the systems than we would. So we want to both develop this uh, you know, process and our model crop in silico, but we also want to enable experimentation and modification of assumptions on the part of other researchers as well. Uh, so this is a, a, an example of this where we've constructed a web app that utilizes this interface to instrument in situ visualization uh, for photosynthesis and allows you to modify the inputs and examine the output parameters from it. We've already had some success uh, with constructing a, a set of models 
uh, from across different labs. So at present, we've, uh, we have, per, uh, in, our, in our project itself, instrumented eight different models from five labs in four languages for two species of plant. Uh, but that's just internal to us. Uh, as Amy will mention as she talks about the conference uh, at the end, we've seen uh, uptake of this across uh, we, uh, different groups, and we're working to expand our collaborations. The uh, Crops and Silico project is open source from the ground up. At present, you can go to the, uh, to the Crops and Silico organization and find all of our model code as well as all the user interface code, the sys interface code itself, uh, and uh, additionally information on how to, how to instrument your models, you know, detailed tutorials and so on. Um, the final thing that I want to end with is noting that, uh, you know, we've used this visual metaphor of the, the plant with the puzzle pieces uh, throughout the course of this talk. And I've gone ahead and I've, I've recreated that visual metaphor here. And I've colored all of the puzzle pieces orange because orange is the official University of Illinois color. Um, this is, is one approach to a research project where you have a largely vertically integrated stack uh, centered at one research group or one uh, institution. And that is not what we are aiming for with the Crops and Silico project. And one of the reasons that Amy and I are so happy to talk to you today, uh, we're interested in instead uh, identifying different um, interesting and uh, uh, potential research collaborations with other universities and seeing if we can change that puzzle to be colored slightly differently. And I know this sounds trite, but uh, we, we really do believe that, that we can bake into this from the start uh, an eagerness to collaborate and an eagerness to identify uh, different approaches, different assumptions, and uh, different ways of, of thinking about uh, the problem in order to produce a crop in silico. And by reducing the technical friction and minimizing the number of assumptions that we require models to make, uh, we hope that we can foster collaboration. Um, Amy, I think. Yeah, sure. And uh, so one way that we have actively been trying to foster that collaboration is that we have held our Crops and Silico Symposium, and then we've added a hackathon this past year. So we just had our third symposium, and we're planning on having another one next year. We don't have a date to share with you, but we will update it on our website as soon as we do. But we have had um, researchers come from all over the globe to this symposium and share with us their research, their ideas, and help guide us and how we can build a better tool for the entire community. And so finally, uh, we just want to acknowledge a lot of our um, team that's here at Illinois and other places. Uh, so Matt and I direct this project along with Steve Long. And so the first part is a lot of the biologists that are working. And then we have our collaborators at the National um, Center for Supercomputing Applications in particular. Megan Lang is really the one who's built the, built the framework. Um, and then we do have collaborators at Penn State uh, who are building these root models and that's sort of our step one in building any one of these virtual crops is that we're connecting above the ground and below ground parts to build a whole plant. It's a <laughs> surprisingly novel idea. And then of course, again, we have to thank our, um, our funding and happy to. All right.